An Empire of Ice and Fire by Longclaw 1-6 Chapter 29 Dragonstone If there was any advantage of having wolf blood mixed in with that of the dragon, John knew it had to be his adaptation to the cold climes of the north. Now, high above in the clouds, with hands wrapped tightly around Rhaegar's neck, the skies were not so different to the whirling snows of the Winterfell winter. The same chill, the same blistering wind, all were alike, and John's hardy northern blood made him suited for it. Gazing across the expanse of air, bits of wispy cloud separating them, was his beloved. Straddling Balerion with the ease of an expert, Daenerys looked breathtaking. The consummate Targaryen queen, more at home on Dragonback than anywhere else. Well, John couldn't help but think. Rhaegal, regal and fiery, the perfect combination in both ruling and intimate life. Gods, I love her. Her head turning, she met his gaze and smiled, pointing downward. Sure enough, the sparkling waves were crashing against a rather large island. Dragonstone. Where his ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror, planned his invasion of Westeros. Down, boy. Roaring, twin roars coming from his brothers, Rhaegar descended rapidly. The green fields grew bigger and bigger, the faster he descended. John involuntarily braced for an impact. That never came. At the last gasp, the green dragon flapped his wings with a powerful gust, arresting his descent until it was no more than a thud on the ground. Compared to Danny's graceful slide down Balerion's shoulder, John's dismount was more of a barely controlled fall. Merry laughter rang out behind him. Don't laugh. Before now, I've only ridden Rhaegal once above tree height. His cheeks flushed red. Seeing the blush, Daenerys thought it was adorable. My dragon wolf, not so dour after all. You did amazingly, John. Hugging him, she felt John relax as she kissed his cheek. You have the blood of Valyrian dragon riders in your veins. All you need is practice. Most likely, John replied kissing her on the lips. Pressing against her lithe body showed it wonders for the chill in his system. Heavy breathing drew John's attention, and sure enough there was Rhaegal, his slit eyes gazing down at him. If the beast had been human, John would have identified it as the way he used to look at his father. Behind, both Balerion and Edoron hooted, sort of like Rob and Arya did to try to get him to join in a game. Chuckling, Daenerys smiled at the sound of John's laughter, finding it refreshing and beautiful. John patted the dragon's nose. Go be with your brothers. Snorting, Rhaegal turned to look to Daenerys, who did the same. Then he hooted back, the three dragons lifting off into the air together. He has a strong bond with you, my love, Danny said, resting an arm on his shoulder and leaning onto it. No wonder he travelled across the seas to find you. Yes. John could feel it from enduring near death at the hands of the Night King, but did not want to hurt Danny with such a memory. She was spooked about the White Walkers already. Carlisi! Both turned to see a parade of several people and a troop of unsullied guards arriving at the cliff face. In the van was Jorah Mormont. I take it the battle was won then? Yes, a close run thing, Danny said. But a victory. We have an alliance. The North, the Vale, and the Riverlands, more or less. Turning to the Unsullied, she began speaking in Valyrian. John didn't follow, though he was planned on asking Miss Andy to teach him as soon as he returned to Winterfell. A Targaryen that didn't know Valyrian was the same as a Stark who couldn't walk in the snow. Shifting his eyes, John was then face to face with Sir Jorah. You served at the Wall with my father, yes? Jorah Mormont. John knew who this man was at first glance. He looked just like the old bear. I was his personal steward. He was a great man. Jorah's eyes glassed over, the hardened knight seeing the fond memories flash before his eyes. My father. He no longer live, lives, does he? No. John shook his head, sharing Jorah's sense of loss. Gior Mormont had been his mentor, a hero in his eyes. He died bravely, trying to save his men. Lyanna now rules Bear Island. Major's daughter, 
Knowing her, Leanna's probably a spitfire. Jorah grinned. That is an understatement. Seeing the knight's eyes falling to the sword strapped to his hip, John placed his hand on the pommel. I saved his life from a monster. He gave me his sword, Longclaw. That was supposed to go to his heir. A raised hand stopped him. If my father thought you should have it, then as his son I must respect it. I brought disgrace to House Mormont, and the man who won the heart of Daenerys Targaryen has proven himself far worthier of the sword than I could ever be. The two nodded simultaneously, one northerner to another. High honour, the way of their land. Finished speaking with Daenerys, the stone-faced Essosi stepped forward. John felt he wouldn't want to face this one in battle. You, Jon Snow. Aye, you must be Grey Worm. Grey Worm nodded. Thank you for protecting Queen Daenerys. You have gratitude from I. John shrugged. I'd say it was she that protected me, but thank you. Cutting in, laughing, Danny grabbed John's hand. Come, Lord Snow. Time to meet the prince and princess. Feet clattering on the grave floors, John ran his feet along the mar- intricate murals that decorated the walls. Feet clattering on the grey floors, John ran his hands along the intricate murals that decorated the walls. Images of history, of the Valyrian Empire and the freehold that followed it. Of Aegon's conquests, of the history of the Targaryen family. His family. It hadn't yet sunken in completely, that he wasn't just a Stark, but a Targaryen as well. A wolf and a dragon. The mix of two great houses of fire and ice. Once barely in possession of an identity at all, now he had two of the absolute best of all noble blood in his veins, betrothed to a dragon rider with two two children from her that he never even met. More dragon than wolf. It was overwhelming. Hey, his deep musings were broken by Danny, cupping his cheek. Why are you brooding, John? Nothing. Just. He looked outside to where the dragons were circling. Nothing. Firm hands brought him back to her. You're just as much a Stark as you are Targaryen, John. Danny smiled. They are still your family. He smiled as well. His beloved knew exactly what to say. Muffled Dothraki curses and scuffling sandals broke them from their enchanted moment. Where are those two? I am going to. A pretty woman with olive skin turned the corner and ran straight into John and Daenerys. Your grace. She bowed. I did not know you had returned. Calm down, Daria. Danny remarked. You remember, John. The handmaid's eyes went wide, finally noticing the comely lad replaced with a strikingly handsome warrior king. We have come to see our children. Her subtle focus on our only made John's heart clench. She wasn't hiding them at all, broadcasting their relationship with pride. Well, you see, the Dothraki former slave only wanted to die. There was no telling if the Queen would have her dragons do the deed quite soon. I'm not sure where they are. Darius' panic was starting to affect Daenerys, when the sound of childlike laughter echoed faintly throughout the halls. John felt his heart clench. Hearing the joyful sounds, I've got you, Tarn Stark, came a girlish voice. Bend the knee. A king in the north never bends the knee, replied a boy, trying to sound noble, but was interspersed with giggles. You will feel the wrath of winter, Visenya. From the looks of it, they were having a grand old time, reminding John of the days when he and Rob and then Bran and Arya played in the courtyard at Winterfell. Happy memories. At that point, the sources of the voices ran into view, laughing and smiling as they play-acted their fighting. Told you the dragon would defeat you, giggled the girl. The dire wolf will rise again. Muna! The boy, Rhaegar, saw his mother and beamed. Moving up to run into her arms, the prince instead ended up running smack into Arya instead. Watch it, Arya! He rubbed his shoulder. But Arya didn't hear him. Ignoring her mercy, maid, 
ignoring her mother, who she had been initially excited to see once more, to concentrate on the man in black leather with tied up raven hair. He was so familiar to her, but she just couldn't place him. Feeling his body sag, heart beating out of his chest, emotion swirled through John. For the first time of his life, he felt like crying. Upon the first glance, there were no doubt that they were his children. Half him and half Daenerys. Rhaegar had the same handsome Targaryen looks as his true father. But with the northern resoluteness that characterised himself, Rob, and his other father, Ned Stark, Arya looked like a mixture of his beloved and her namesake, whom John also loved dearly. They were perfect. His children. I'm your father, John wanted to say it. Tell them who he was. But the emotion of seeing them for the first time was so overwhelming that he was just silent. That man. I've seen him before. An image came to Arya's mind. One cloudy and dreamlike. Suddenly she gasped. Little grey eyes widening as she looked at the man, then her mother, who was smiling and tearing up at the same time. The father? Rhaegar caught on then as well, then and there, eyes widening as well. Father? Noticing John lost for words, hitching his breath and trying to stop the tears from forming in his eyes. And for once, the dour northerner was losing. Daenerys nodded. It's your father. Father! Father! As if automatically, John fell to his knees and opened his arms wide just as two bundles slammed into him. He closed his arms around them in a tight embrace. There was no stopping the tears anymore. His normal brooding nature vanishing from the icy stabbing at not being there for his children's lives and the rays of warmth that finally being with them, banishing the ice away. Your father is here, my sweetlings. Arya buried her face into his chest, inhaling his spicy northern scent and feeling fully safe and secure. I knew you'd come. Stay with us, Papa. Don't ever leave. Rhaegar pleaded. Never. Daddy's here. Now, Daddy will never leave. Openly crying, Danny watched the scene tenderly, a stray hand wiping the tears from her lids. It was this, this right here that meant more to her than any throne or crown or kingdom. Family. Her family. Her beloved John and her dear children. Their children. Together at last. Then a strong hand encircled her wrist and yanked her down. Yelping softly, it was her that nestled into the embrace as well. All kneeling, John's face buried in her hair, the twins sandwiched between them. It had been on Dragonstone, where Daenerys Targaryen found her family wrenched away from her. It was now, on Dragonstone, where she found her family reborn. You see here? One of the wildlings, Tormund if her memory was correct pointed to a large wooden pike nearly half a foot in diameter. The damn Boltons would have ridden right through us with their horses had the other southerners not stopped them. A smirk formed on Sansa's face. It was amusing to hear the likes of the Starks or the Hornwoods being referred to as southerners. To the free folk, anyone living south of the wall was a southerner. Go on, Tormund, Sir Dabasant asked, grinning. He picked up the pike with both hands. Those morons with the spears. Hoplites. They're called hoplites. Davos offered jovially. Whatever. Many of the wildlings had tried to murder the Bolton prisoners. There had been many. To settle the score they had caused. Since they were lacking a house to serve at the moment, Tyrion had suggested to John, Rob, Daenerys and Sansa that they be sent to Marine as a reinforcement. At least until they had redeemed themselves. Having bent the knee to both House Stark and the Dragon Queen, 
The new Stark Bannerman had been sent to White Harbour to take a voyage to Slaver's Bay. There's bears nearly stopped old Mag over there. The grizzled giant grinned, grunting softly. Being a giant, the soft grunt was rather loud. If a weak moron of a spear could do that, imagine what these bitches could do to horsemen. They did look impressively stout and deadly, Sansa noted. I like it. Have the free folk warriors equipped with them. At Tormund's nod, she turned away and left the armory. Just outside the door, the chill hit her. Sansa heard a familiar flutter and screech, followed by something perching on her shoulder. A small smile crept on her face. Hello, girl. Sansenia chirped happily, nuzzling her small but growing head on her namesake's offered finger. You're growing quite well. Your parents would be happy. Admitting a low whine, the orange dragon lowered her head. Sansa figured it was as close to a look of sadness as a dragon could give. I know. I miss them too. Even surrounded by soldiers and loyal guards, Sansa didn't feel completely safe from evils such as Ramsay, unless both Jon and Rob were present. Hearing twin screeches upon reaching the stairs to the balcony, she extended her left arm in expectation. Sure enough, Rayella and Leonaris perched themselves upon her, hissing and snapping their jaws at each other. Enough! Sansa told them sternly, and they obeyed. They seemed to have an attachment to Sansa, not loving her as deeply as they did their parents, but allowing her to touch them and obeying her commands. Only Rob, Marjorie and Missandei shared such a skill. And they were all in out inspecting the Dothraki and Unsullied. Sansa was sure Jon's twins would grow up to be more agreeable, since they wouldn't grow up with the capacity to spit dragonfire. Jon has children. It still shocked her to think about it. That he was a father and she was an aunt. Looking down at the courtyard, where the memories returned of him playing with Rob, Bran and Arya, while she sewed and minded her lessons inside. Where I shunned him. Guilt and bitterness filled her. The dragons, sensing it, quieted down. At least now Sansa had a chance. John loved her all the same. And deep down, Sansa always had as well. He'll be a great father. I know that. Sansa! The acting lady of Winterfell turned, face still so stone. Mother? Upon seeing the sight of her, the three dragons hissed and took off. They didn't like Catelyn, as if having a sixth sense about the past. It was mirrored in Sansa's icy gaze. The warmth and joy of their reunion had dissipated and the recent anger bubbled forward, but a good lady wears a mask when in public. Any news from Uncle Brendan? Yes, he reached Moat Caelan, and scouts reported that the twins are open. This drew Sansa's attention. What? They had given her great uncle a third of the Vale Knights to deal with whatever remaining forces Walder Frey had, expecting a tough fight. Now, the most strategic bridge in the Seven Kingdoms was open and undefended. Did he flee south like the rat of a sinking ship? Catelyn shook her head. Apparently the entirety of House Frey was massacred by an unknown party. Walder Frey's throat is slit, his eldest son mutilated, and the rest poisoned. Whatever Frey men remained melted away into the countryside. Sansa shared her mother's look, a look of justice being served. Good, he can rot in hell. Then a thought occurred to her. Is Uncle Edmure alive? Yes. Her mother seemed quite genuinely relieved by that. He was freed by the scouts and reunited with his wife and son. Send a raven to Mount Caelan. Tell Uncle Brendan to march to River Run immediately and secure it before any of the Lannister allied houses do. If they hold the castle, then the land routes to the Vale would be open, and it would be essentially secure everything north of the River Trident for John and Daenerys. Sansa knew it, and she bet that Tywin Lannister knew it as well. Her mother seemed impressed and swelled with stoic pride. Of course, my lady. The pride only provoked another steely glare. Catelyn knew it all too well. The glare that Daenerys had sent her way the first month in Marine. The one Rob cast her as well. Now that all knew the truth, the reckoning for her actions had come, and it was all deserved. Sansa... When did you know? 
for all her anger at her mother, for not only shunning John, but for essentially making herself shun John as well, she remained composed. The words carried no emotion. The truth about him, I mean. The elder woman closed her eyes. The night of the feast, when the king arrived. Your father and Uncle Benjamin told me. No wonder you allowed him by Brand's bedside, rather than send him away. That had been odd to Sandra at the time. For the young girl she had been, it had caused her to be nicer to John as well before they left. I just can't understand why father didn't tell you at least. Not that it justified what you did. It didn't. Sansa knew she deserved every bit of this from her children. She admired it, actually. How close they were with their brother. Rob had grown humble, strategic, a true lord. Sansa had become the definition of a lady. Poised and calculated. If only it hadn't turned out the way it did. It hadn't been the first time that she prayed to the gods for a chance to change things. Looking back at the courtyard, the perch on the balcony was always the calmest part of the castle for Sansa, mostly because of all the memories it brought. When her niece and nephew would come, she smiled inwardly at the joy it would bring. Such joy had been missing for so long in this place. John has already forgiven you. Daenerys, Rob and I haven't, but he has. Likely tells all of us who the better one is. The one fit to rule. Catelyn closed her eyes, the arctic wind blowing against her face. Yes, it does. Sliding the whetstone along the sharp steel, dulled by constant use on the battlefield, Podrick Payne kept darting back to the two women on the balcony. To one of them in particular. His time with Brienne had tempered his innate shyness, and the incident with the women Tyrion and Bronn acquired for him did increase his confidence. But when in the company of the fiery-haired northerner, it had all come back. There wasn't a more breathtaking sight. Oi, boy. The sword dropped to the ground, the whetstone following with a clang onto the steel at the startling voice. Bronn felt a strong hand smack him onto his back as Tormund Giantsbane sat down beside him. You look distracted, lad. Is it a girl? Podrick blinked, not knowing what to say in these situations. While battle could drum bad fighting skills out of a youth, only experience with women, not your family, knight or paid companion, could overcome a youthful shyness. Um, I... well... Another belly laugh left the wildling. There's only two things that get a man this distracted. Food for one that's starving and a pretty lady. Podrick's flickering eyes betrayed him, and Tormund traced them to the balcony where the lone woman rested, Catelyn having retired to the solar. Ah! The King Crow's sister. Good choice. Us gingers are beautiful, kissed by fire. Trying not to stammer a reply, Podrick failed to make a noise. Instead, he grabbed the sword and went back to sharpening it. There was no way he was discuss his secret longing with the boisterous wildling. One word to Lord Snow and Longclaw would be thrust up his gut for even thinking about his sister. The wildling never got the hint. With a woman, boy, you have to go in strong. Like with my woman, a great golden beauty, taller than any woman alive. There was no mistaking who Tom had refiled to. Lady Brienne? This was news to him. Some of Lord Tyrion's fondness for gossip having transferred to his former squire. You're with her? Not yet. But I've seen the way she looks at me. Contemptuously, thought Podrick at first the wildling, began to opine about having giant babies with her. The young squire wondered if Tormon's feelings, though far more boisterous and exaggerated, were essentially what his were in regards to the Lady Sansa. She was the daughter of a great house, blood impeccable on both sides. He was just a simple squire, unfit, no matter how many times he saved her. Looking up, Sansa had gone. Hearing Tormund still talking, Podrick sighed and went back to sharpening his blade. Father, setting the precious bundle on his bed, John ruffled his hair gently. Rhaegar was a hellion. Tiring himself out with all the running he had done with his sister, 
It took all of John's night watch endurance to keep up. Just like Bran. Before his fall. A sudden protective urge sprang forth like a growling wolf. A wolf protecting his cubs. The snow? Is it everywhere? He smiled, kissing his son's brow. It covers everything. Quite annoying, actually. But it protects us from outsiders. Northerners call it General Winter. I can't wait to see snow. Propping his hands under his head, Rhaegal's violet eyes met John's. They were exactly like Danny's. Are there dire wolves there? Packs of them? A yawn formed. Sleep beginning to overcome the little prince as he snuggled on his pillow. Covering him up with the blanket, John stroked his cheek. No packs, but I do have a dire wolf. His name's Ghost, as fur as white as snow. A smile curled on his son's face as he fell into the gentle embrace of sleep. Wiping away a tear, John turned and walked to the other bed. Good night, my sweetling. Arya never ceased to make his heart clench, looking the perfect mix between his mother and his beloved. Stay with us, Papa, she softly cried, reaching for his cheek. A finger stroked John's prickly beard. Don't go. John kissed her cheek. I'll be right in the next room. Both Visenya and Rhaenys had been protective mother dragons, from what Danny had told him. The king's chamber in Dragonstone Castle was built with a doorway to the nursery, in case either queen had to rush to their children. Mama and Papa will be here in a heartbeat if you call. F eyes fluttering shut, Arya nodded. Love you, Papa. Then she was asleep like her brother. Heading for the door. John couldn't stop the few tears from hitting the stone floor. Love you too, sweetling. Where once the great throne room had been filled with colour and light, to Jamie Lannister it now reminded him of the darkest of dungeons. His divine majesty, the Golden Chimera, preferred to hold his infrequent bordering on never, which was the case for his attendance at the small council's meetings, sessions of court at night. Only a smattering of candles banished away the darkness, and the once vibrant stained glass windows had been bricked over, while two braziers gave the area around the Iron Throne itself any light. Rumour was that the king more frequently held meetings in the dungeon itself, but Jamie had luckily never been summoned. Those that were alleged to never returned. Naturally, his eyes fell on Cersei, her bewitching gold hair standing out amongst the darkness. Armoured boots clacked on the stone floor. He quickly arrived at her side and kissed her cheek from behind. Sister. Jamie noticed her tensing up before relaxing at the sound of his voice. Brother, she replied, outwardly reserved but with a hint of warmth. Though she would always be beautiful to him, Jamie hated the state she was in now. Her eyes were sunken from stress rather than hunger, though her appetite wasn't the best. Cersei looked years older than she was, and there was a nervousness about her that threatened to break her. Before, she had strode through the Red Keep as if she owned it. But now, even when their father was here, the walls had his, and the king was their son. Do you know why we were summoned here? Beside them, there was a nervous... Hunchbacked Pycel, Iron Bank representative Tycho Nestorus, I don't know if I pronounced that right, and Littlefinger, who in his own unctuous way looked nervous. No one tells me anything anymore, but my sources tell me that the problem in the north has been taken care of. So that should be good news, right? The victory at Sunspear had been heralded with a week's thanksgiving. Why hasn't Joffrey hailed it? They spoke in hushed tones. Cersei gave him a pained grimace. Bolton and Viserys Targaryen were defeated by Ned Stark's bastard son, and a live Rob Stark, the Veil vale Knights that switched sides, and the Dragon Queen. Cersei, Jamie, grimaced as well. The eventuality that their father had been warning of and preparing for had finally come. Unlike when the king sounded his arrival to the whole city, a simple gong heralded his presence in the throne room. 
Cersei fell to her knees, as did Jaime and all the others. It was a privilege of Joffrey's munificence and trust, the most anyone had seen him give to his family since making Tywin his supreme commander of the armies, following the Battle of Blackwater Bay, the ability to merely be on one's knees in his presence rather than frustrate himself. It rankled Jamie, but he said nothing. The ringing of the gong still echoed throughout the throne room. In walked the royal procession. In the van was the High Sparrow, arms crossed over his chest as always. Surrounded by his guards was the king. Waddling beside him was the fat form of Dantas Hollard, the king's fool. Rounding out the rear was the ever-scheming vestige of Kyburn. Jamie didn't trust him when the false maester brought him back from the Riverlands with Ta Brienne of Tarth, and the feeling had only grown since. This evening, began the High Sparrow, as he did on all private meetings of the small council. We implore the Seven to hear our thanks for the gift of their child upon this earth. We say our thanks before the Seven, everyone repeated. What happened to my son? He'd become some sick caricature of Baelor the Blessed in Jamie's eyes. Cersei blamed it all on the High Sept and Tywin. Tywin on Kyburn. But Jamie thought differently. He was always cruel. But it was Littlefinger that planted the seed. Since then, the madness had just grown and grown. Taking a seat on the Iron Throne, a cushion placed there for his comfort, Jake Joffrey peered down at each person. Let us begin, Pycelle, he barked. Why is it getting colder? I had to wear additional clothes this morning. Forgive me, or I just bumbled the old man, but the Citadel has said that winter has arrived. Joffrey hissed. One day I will control the weather to prevent this. Right, Sparrow? Of course, the seven are kind to their child. Likely preening under his veil, Joffrey next turned to Littlefinger. Lord Baelish, has the dragon spawn been drawn and quartered for his rebellion by the veil? Trembling, Baelish nodded. That rebellion was put down, but I beg your forgiveness for informing you, your highest, that another rebellion has formed. There was silence. Gulping, he continued. The Dragon Queen has returned from Marine and landed in the north. She has joined forces there, deposed her brother, and allied with the treasonous Vale Knights to oppose you. What? Joffrey felt his heart beating out of his chest. The walls were closing in. Enemies everywhere, dangerous and ready to pounce. He didn't feel safe. Not even with the swords of the Mountain, Meron Trant, and thousands of completely loyal faith militants. And his army. Where is Tywin? Where is my army? He is in Dawn, my son. Fighting to keep your kingdom intact. He needs to be here. If I may, or highest. The Chimera's withering gaze fell on Littlefinger. A detachment of heavy cavalry and light men-at-arms has arrived in port today, under the command of Randall Tarly. There was a silence from the king. Is he a fool? The contemptuous scowl fell up to on Sir Davos, still sitting in a corner. His record is distinguished, combined with the men we have in the Crownlands and the Westerlands. You'll have an army of over 40,000, Littlefinger said, a voice dripping with oiled words. One must only make the Sovereign's last thought of you a grateful one. All other mistakes would be forgiven. A sidelong look at the Lannister twins only proved that it was not the Chimera that could burn him. And the dragons? It was Kyburn that answered the king. The scorpions have been delivered to all formations, all highest. They were effective in the battle at Winterfell, and will be even greater in a more concentrated formation. Attack now, while the surprise is still on your side. Yes, they must attack at once, but not Tarly. A finger pointed below the dais. You, uncle. All highest? Jamie was confused. I am your loyal guard, sworn to protect you from all harm. It wasn't because of Joffrey that he served loyally. Snapping his fingers at Trant and Blout, they scrambled down the stairs and began stripping the King's Guard markers off from Jamie's armour. You are now general in my army. Go forth and destroy the North and I should have been done when I thought Rob Stark to be killed. Blood boiled within him. 
Turn every settlement to the fire. Burn it all to ash. No, you can't. Cersei couldn't get the images from her mind as soon as her son said for Jamie to head north. Images of Jamie beheaded, impaled, a large dragon burning him alive at the hands of the Targaryen queen. He had barely survived one foray into the north. Breaking protocol, she climbed the steps and grabbed his shoulders. Don't do this, my son. Do not risk your family. A backhanded slap sent her falling. Do not touch me, Joffrey snarled. You may be my mother, but you are a mere mortal. I am a god. At the beginning of her son's reign, Cersei had seen his outbursts as those of a child. A cruel child, but one still innocent of the evil gripping the world. But now, one look in his eyes. Not that she could see them directly anymore. Only made it clear to her the monster that he had become. No, he's still my child, my eldest. No mother stops loving her child no matter what he became. But Cersei was afraid of him, nonetheless. Should I teach this one a lesson? Not to res disrespect her king? From the growling and matter in trance voice, it sounded like he'd enjoy it. Before Jamie could do something incredibly stupid to protect her, it was the High Sparrow that intersected. Discord amongst the righteous only benefits the wicked, or highest. Humble and penitent before his god, the former nobleman knew that the imperfect king only needed the right guiding hand. The queen mother's heart is in the right place. So perhaps a private refresher on the true meaning of the faith is all that is needed. Still as a statue for agonisingly long minutes, Joffrey finally waved his hands. Durant stepped away from Cersei, allowing Jaime to kneel next to her. She should rest now, your highness. Of course. His tone had softened, mollified that the threats were ending. Mother, see to it that you have that looked at. It was the only thing close to an apology Cersei knew that would be given. Thank you, All Highest. Turning to the High Sparrow to dismiss the meeting, Joffrey involuntarily staggered back. The ghostly vestige of Robert Baratheon. Instead of mottled grey of a corpse, he was ethereal. Pale, but blood still dripped to the ground. No! His voice was filled with terror. No! Woman born of storm, fair of eye. It's her, isn't it? All around him waited patiently, breath baited with concern, but unwilling to provide or provoke his wrath. The Dragon Queen. Golden face she sees. A realm divide. Nearly falling over, only the helpful arms of Meryn Trant steadied him. Master of Whispers, where is the Dragon Queen? My little birds have her in Dragonstone, or your highest. With her two children. Kill her! I want her dead! She must never see me! If such a request puzzled those in the room, no one voiced it. They knew better. Kyburn allowed a smile. I have already seen to it, your highest, from a person desperate to prove his loyalty to you. A great crime to harm a woman and child, opined the High Sparrow, but it is necessary for those who have defied the will of the Seven's Chosen on the earth. Nothing but the flickering candles answered him. This is suicide, my lady. It was still surreal to be called that. Hells, it was surreal for Tyene Sand to be in the very situation she was in. Staring at the stars through this vision slit, a truly hammered home how isolated and weak she was at the moment. We are having trouble with procuring replacements and reinforcements. Another or one of her generals. In the chaos and vacuum that Tywin's march through Dawn had brought, most of the populace had flocked to Tristane's government for security and bread, if nothing else. What men and women they had were scattered amongst the wilderness, in isolated hillside dugouts, and in tunnels such as this one, where Tywin's men couldn't root them out. How long will we inspire the populace if you leave? And how will we hope to win without allies? 
she hissed back. We were always loyal to the Targaryens. Now that the Dragon Queen has arrived in Westeros, she is the only hope to shake off the yoke. It made her generals uneasy. Our loyalty is to you, as to your father, is unquestioned. But how can you place confidence in the family that betrayed Elia Martel for some wolf bitch from the north? Tyene grimaced. So, we let the Lannisters, who killed Elia and her children and enslaved many Dornish, rule us because the Dragon Queen's brother fell in love with a northerner? There was silence. Can you transport me to Dragonstone? Yes, my lady. Then do it. And, okay, let me just whiz past this bit. Do, 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 do. Um, uh, do, do, do. Danny continued the languid kiss. I love you, John. I love you too, Danny. Giving her a break before he would send her to the stars once more, John allowed the events of the day to fully sink in. I really am a father. He rolled over onto his back. The comfortable temperatures of the island, chilly but warm compared to the north, precluded his need for a blanket. Goose down rather than northern furs. Yes, you are. Danny perched herself on her elbow, admiring the fine specimen of a man that she loved. Two children and six dragons. They all love you, John. That rare, loving smile crossed John's lips. I love them too. He pushed back onto his side and cupped Jenny's cheek. And their mother. John watched with rapture as she leaned into his palm, eyes fluttering in contented joy. I will never leave any of you again. I promise. And Danny thought he could never get any sexier or more amazing. A dragon wolf went and said something like that. Together, my love. Forever. Arms pulling him close. Danny felt she couldn't stand another moment without his touch. When I take back the Iron Throne from Joffrey, I will have you by my side. To rule with me. John sighed. You don't have to. I never wanted even a lordship let alone a crown. He looked at her. You've planned this for so long to have the throne. Fought hard for it. It's yours. John. The fact that he would so willingly give her his birthright only proved to her that he was the man she needed. The king the realm needed. My love. I don't want the throne unless you rule alongside me. The endless spokes of families on the wheel that keep turning. We will break it. Together. She placed her hands on his shoulder. Blood of my blood. It is both of us that will leave this world better than the one we inherited. As equals. I never thought I would be. I was a mere bastard. Content to live out the war for the rest of my days. And now... I'm the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. Pulling away, Danny saw insecurity, self-doubt in his eyes. Do I really deserve it? I was merely Lord Commander and my men killed me for it. You do deserve it, John. There's no one who deserves it more. She kissed his cheek. Rhaegar will learn to be a king from the best. For you already are a great leader, John. Lips placing a flurry of kisses on his cheeks, nose, eye and forehead. Danny hugged John tightly. I've been dreaming of this day. All four of our family. Together. Forever. She kissed him, cupping his face. Five, John mumbled against her mouth, mirroring her kiss. Feeling her pull back, a puzzled look on her violet orbs. John realised he hadn't told her. How did I not tell her? He had planned to tell her the morning after the battle, but she beat him to it with the news of the twins. There are five tar- living Targaryens. Viserys is not a Targaryen. The Dragon Queen returned, face stony and voice tinged with anger. As Queen, I've decided to revoke his legitimacy as punishment for his crimes. He is no Targaryen. Ugh. 
John rolled his eyes. First off, thank you for reminding me that I'm related to that slug. Danny snorted, amused. At least my father was a great man. And Danny. He placed the palm of on her soft cheek, stroking the milky skin with his thumb. There are five Targaryens, my dragon. Your great uncle Aemon. Danny stared at him, mouth slack. My great uncle? Aegon the fifth's brother? John nodded. How do you know him? Gently stroking her back, it brought John great joy to see his love reunited completely with a family long thought dead. Now I know why Maester Aemon always kept me close. Aemon was, well, is the maester at Castle Black. He's very old and essentially blind, but his mind is sharp and will strong. My... John's breath hitched for a moment. My Uncle Benjamin told him about my heritage, and he told me right before. His eyes moved to the scar on his heart, where Danny rested her head. I thought... I thought all Targaryens had been killed, but both Viserys and I... Tears welled in Danny's eyes. John kissed the tears away. Aemon is coming down from Castle Black with Sam Tarly, a good friend of mine. You'll see him when we return. He leaned up to kiss her forehead. He loves you, you know. Whatever information that came in from Marine and Essos, he would pour over it. Our family lives. She had always thought that, given her brother's humiliating stain on the house, she and the twins were the last dragons. Not anymore. She had her beloved dragon wolf, and now her great uncle as well. I love you so much, John. She buried her face in his dark northern hair. You've brought nothing but light and joy into my life since we met. I don't know what I'd do without you, Danny. Feeling her snuggle against him, John smiled. You and Amon will get along. And the same with Sam. Hmm. Are you and he close? He's my best friend at the wall. Sam was born of a noble house in the Reach, but his father hated him because he was bookish rather than athletic. He actually wasn't shocked at my heritage. And why is that, my love? At that moment, John felt a chill on his skin, recalling that moment that he had faced a white for the first time, its mottled grey skin, glowing blue eyes. One of the dead had gotten into the Lord Commander's quarters, Sir Jorah's father. I had lost my sword trying to defend against it, and that monster was strangling me. He felt his queen tighten her hold on him. The Lord Commander then entered with Ghost, allowing me to break free, and I grabbed a lantern and managed to burn it alive. But the fire didn't hurt my hand. Staring at him, Danny saw John in a new light, the same as she had seen when his, their daughters first showed themselves to her. The unburnt! Just as she did, John had braved the flames and come out without a scratch. Blood of the dragon. Fire made flesh. Taking his hand, Danny kissed the palm lovingly. John smiled before fire blazed in her violet eyes and he soon found himself pinned onto the bed. Danny? Keeping his hands pinned over his head, Danny kissed John hard and moved to suck on his neck. You and me, John. The Iron Throne is ours. We will rule together. For our family. All of us. My king. And I'm cutting it short there, but it's only one more sentence, so I think we're good. <laughs> End of chapter. Hi, guys. Hope you enjoyed this. Oh, I like that chapter. I like it a lot. So, Podrick's got a bit of a crush on Sansa. I actually really like that idea. I just ship them. It's, it's like with Marjorie and Rob. And of course, the little dragon wolves being reunited with their dad for the first time. I mean, that is so cute. It's so cute. It's so sweet. Tying sands on the move. And I mean, I would never would have imagined Joffrey backhanding his mother. I mean, yeesh. Oof. But also a reference to Arya completely decimating the phrase. Ha! I wouldn't be surprised if Gendry just stopped at the front of the castle and said, if you're not back by morning, I'm coming in after you. 
She just gives him a kiss and says, you underestimate me. Then just goes waltzing in and does what she does. I can so imagine that happening in my head. That little scene there. Oh, I want. I wanted to see that, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, remember to like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for never upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another one of my videos. Bye.